of our webinar, but let me more positively welcome you to what I think will be a fascinating seminar ahead of the 75th session of the UN General Assembly. My name is Douglas Alexander, and this afternoon we'll be trying to answer the question, can multilateralism re be rebuilt for the post-COVID world? Let me just start briefly with some housekeeping. The event is being recorded and live streamed, or, le or at least on the basis of what we've just encountered, we sincerely hope it's being live streamed and recorded um, and will be visible thereafter. So as attendees, you can post questions in the question and answer box, and we'd really appreciate it if you can also put your name and organization when you post your question. Joining us today to discuss this topic, I'm delighted to say, is Ambassador Elizabeth Cousins. Ambassador Cousins will be known, no doubt, to many of you. She became the United Nations Foundation's third president and chief executive officer in 2020. She, of course, prior to that, had a long and distinguished career in diplomacy, having been central over many years to some of the most powerful United Nations policy innovations from peace building through to the establishment of the Sustainable Development Goals. And so I can think of no one better qualified or indeed suited to help us look ahead to this year's General Assembly, or indeed to discuss the broader crisis of multilateralism in which this General Assembly is taking place. Ambassador, thank you for making the time to join us today. We really appreciate you being with us. Let me maybe just begin both with a word of welcome, but also to offer you this opening question. The theme of the UN General Assembly Week this year is it's the future we want, the United Nations we need, reaffirming our collective commitment to multilateralism. How much do you think this theme reflects an understanding of the weakness of multilateralism today, perhaps compared with past decades when we presumed the UN General Assembly was happening in a context of widespread support for its goals and ambitions. Well, first of all, let me thank you again for welcoming me and saying what an honor it is to be speaking to the Royal United Services Institute and everyone on the line today as we look ahead to what will surely be an atypical meeting of the UN General Assembly. And I'm tempted to say that the experience we just had a few minutes ago is kind of an emblem for the world we're in. I want to say the world is having technical difficulties. Please stand by, I think is, is really a metaphor for our times. You have really started with the fundamental question. We are at a turning point for multilateralism and the international system we've known and lived with for 75 years. And the challenges we face starting with COVID-19 but not limited to COVID-19 are global in nature and they will only truly be solved through collective global action. So we absolutely need effective multilateral institutions but the system we've got is both under siege and it needs to change. So yes, this theme represents a, a profound recognition across the membership that this is the fundamental question of our time, that it's urgent and that it's a test for all of us. And in my view, it's a test we absolutely need to pass. I mean, I'll just maybe elaborate. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, please elaborate on that. Help us understand yeah. what lies behind that sense of jeopardy. Well, just think about the landscape this year. We are facing a once in a century global pandemic. 19 of the 20 hottest years on record occurred in the last 20 years. The number of food insecure in the world is set to double. We have mass protests in many of our countries on everything from racial justice to climate change. You throw in a trade war and rising tensions between the US and China. It is abundantly clear that we are facing challenges that are what my old boss Kofi Annan used to call problems without passports. But you know, we also need to keep in mind beyond the threat landscape that keeps us all awake at night, how much progress we've made that we need to protect. You know, it was just a few weeks ago that the world declared the end of the wild polio virus in Africa after decades of effort. You know, just five years ago, every country on the planet signed up to the sustainable development goals and countries adopted and ratified the Paris Agreement faster than any treaty in history. You know, we lifted a billion people out of poverty over the last generation and the stakes are just so high, you know, until recently, give you another example, we were well on our way to decimating measles. Now measles is one of the biggest killers of kids under five. This year, because of COVID-19, 80 million kids are likely to miss their measles vaccine. 
And that's just a tragic reversal. And it doesn't get solved when countries act alone. It will only get solved when countries act together. And that's why this is just so, so important. Elizabeth, as you describe problems without passports, it's a brilliant description of the common challenges that we face around the world. How do you account for the rise of nativism, the rise of populism? Should we think of nativism, populism, nationalism as a symptom or a cause of the contemporary crisis of multilateralism? Well, look, I think uh, both, both and, and there are a lot of complex drivers here and good people will have real debates about how we got where we are. You know, some of it is about cumulative pressures and impacts of globalization that maybe we took our eyes off of. Some of it is about the media environment in which we're operating, including you know, fake news and the deliberate weaponization of mass media to sow distrust and discord. Some of it, I think, honestly goes back to an earlier political generation that had a deliberate philosophy of trying to give government a bad name. And that's contributed to distrust in public institutions of any kind, both national and international. And some of it surely also relates to performance. And there clearly have been failures <laughs> along with important achievements. And we all need to do a better job of talking honestly about both. But the real question to my mind is less how we got here than what we're going to do about it. And the basic question is whether we think our citizens are best served by a world where cooperation works or one where everyone is left on their own. You know, to me, the answer is obvious. And the only question is how to rethink cooperation for the world we face today, how to modernize our institutions in ways that are most relevant and responsive to the challenges we face and that people understand. So, you know, we got to dispense with the acronyms. We, acronyms. we got to talk about the kinds of issues that are at stake and the people who are facing some of the most severe challenges we can imagine in ways that resonate with all of our populations, citizens and taxpayers. I think we can abundantly do that. I'll just give you one little piece of context from the United States. You know, public opinion here is actually much more consistent and favorable on the question of the UN than you might think. We've been doing bipartisan polling in the US about the UN for over a decade. And year after year, our polling shows that Americans bipartisan, on a bipartisan basis, overwhelmingly support a strong US-UN partnership. Last year, the UN had its highest favorability rating in the 10 years we've been doing polling, higher, I would note, than the US Congress. <laughs> and you know, majorities from all parties say that it's important for the United States to maintain an active role in international institutions like the United Nations. Um, we're releasing our latest poll results in a couple of weeks, and all of that's going to hold steady. Positive though those figures are, help me understand how you reconcile that with the defunding of the World Health Organization, the, de the politicization of previously um, neutral humanitarian organizations. What, what does that tell us in terms of how public sentiment in a country like the United States doesn't seem to translate into policy outcomes? No, sure. Um, well, you can imagine that there's a delta between political leadership and the American public on this point is the first thing. And we've done polling that looks institution by institution, including the World Health Organization, which while it has taken a bit of a dent in public opinion in the last several months, it's still it's still high. So um, so I think that's an important point to to acknowledge. Um, the UN has also um, in the United States and in a number of other countries always been a bit of a political football and electoral seasons that tends to go into um, overdrive. So how should we understand the impact of COVID-19 on perceptions of the importance of the work that the United Nations does? My colleague at the Belfer Centre in Harbour, Graham Allison, has recently described the COVID crisis in these terms. He said it's, it's like a flash of lightning that illuminates the landscape for a moment which allowed us to see the contours that were otherwise obscured by the dark and gives understanding to the bigger picture. What do you sense is the bigger picture and what do you sense is specific to the response that we've seen over the last six or nine months to the arrival of the pandemic? Sure. Well, not for the first time, Dr. Allison is right. <laughs> and uh, COVID-19 has put the brightest and most severe possible light on issues that many people on this call have probably been worrying about for years. 
um, you know, I'd take uh, a look at the whole question of preparedness as a way of kind of getting a window into this. And some of you may know that the something called the Global Preparedness Monitoring Board that was set up after the Ebola crisis is actually releasing its latest major report today, uh, importantly titled A World in Disorder. Um, but think about preparedness. The global health community has been warning about a global pandemic of this magnitude for years. They have run scenarios. I'm sure Rusi has done this too. They've run tabletop exercises. People have made movies about it. None of what we are going through right now is remotely a surprise from the source of the virus to the rapidity of spread to the way that the virus is knocking every aspect of our lives and our economies off course. You know, they have been warning us for some time that we have got to get out of this cycle of moving between panic and neglect. So we may not have known it would be a coronavirus or that it would come up precisely in the winter of 2020, but we've known about it. The problem, and Dr. Allison is right, is that we have not demanded that our institutions be geared for preparedness. We have underinvested in them. And then of course we complain when they're weak and we have not cultivated the social and political capital of cooperation that gives us something to rely on when we're in a crisis. So this is a, a terrible and traumatic window through which to understand all kinds of dynamics in world politics and their dynamics that we need to fix because it doesn't only play out in public health but in every other area that matters as well. The Indian um, writer Arundhati Roy has suggested COVID is a, is a portal through which the world can move to a better future. Let's, let's try and shift our focus from description to prescription You've got huge expertise and deep understanding of how the United Nations and its various agencies work. What reforms to global governance would be the top of your own agenda? And how would you score the prospect of those reforms actually being secured in light of what we're all living through at the moment? Well, I'm tempted to ask you how much time you have. <laughs> um, <laughs> And I've got a long running list as do, you know, do many people. Um, look, first, I think it's worth acknowledging quite a number of important reforms that have been undertaken at the UN in just the last few years. And so I, I feel compelled to make sure everybody's aware of them. First, you know, they've overhauled the UN development system to empower a new generation of leaders and country teams to be a really different kind of partner to countries. They've opened up the doors to further and very practical forms of collaboration with the business sector, something that's been long in the generation, but really taken some important strides forward. You know, the UN reached gender parity at all levels of the organization in just two years, which is possibly a world record. And it's certainly a path that many boards would do well to follow with as much speed. Um, for my part, I would suggest a few places where I would start as we think about the future. You know, first, I think there's something fundamentally important about what the Secretary General Antonio Guterres calls inclusive multilateralism. And that's going beyond token representation of involving different kinds of uh, stakeholders and constituencies in meetings, but looking at really meaningful ways that you can open up a system that is built for states to meaningful participation by others who have a stake in what they do whether that is regional leaders, city and state leaders, businesses, citizen groups, young people, finding a way to hold member states to account for their promises and their performance. You know, second, I think the sustainable development goals actually give us a little glimmer into what it could look like if we really do uh, find a way to revitalize multilateral cooperation and negotiation and refresh the way countries engage in the give and take of pursuing their own interests. So I'll give you just a little example. I was the US negotiator on the SDGs and for you know reasons that one could go into, they were negotiated very differently than normal and the groups that normally dominate negotiations like the European Union, like the group of 77 didn't have that much of a role. So it was a much more level playing field. One of the goals that was the most controversial is one called Goal 16. It's the goal on peace and good governance. It happened to matter a lot to the United Kingdom. It mattered a lot to the United States. But the reason we got the goal without disrespect to any of us wasn't because of either of our countries. It was because of countries like Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Timor-Leste who had a voice in that structure and they fought for it. And so that was just a window into what it could look like to revitalize the give and take of multilateral cooperation. 
I think, going forward and happy to speak more to that. Um, two last points on this. I would revolutionize how we track performance and evaluate out outcomes. There's a whole cottage industry in this area, but I think there's hugely important scope for fresh ways to do that in ways that are relevant to the ultimate constituents and all of our citizens and taxpayers. You know, and finally, I think we really need to get back to basics and renew confidence in multilateralism around a, a tighter value proposition for the institutions that is about delivery and is about fundamental um, needs and concerns. Um, we can speak more about that, but, uh, but I think that's an important part of rebuilding a base coalition for the multilateral system that we need. That's a fascinating answer and frankly an important list in terms of reforms. Let's stick with delivery, your final point, and look at the sustainable development goals. Clearly this year was supposed to mark the advent and usher in a decade of ambitious action to try and achieve the goals by 2030. And given all of your work as the American representative, given your knowledge as to the progress that's been made over the last five years, what's your assessment as to how the tumultuous events of this year, not just the pandemic, but the political responses and economic consequences of that pandemic will actually impact on our collective ability to make real progress towards the goals in the remainder of this decade. Well, it's clearly putting all of us to the most severe test in our lifetimes. Mm -hmm. I think it would be a mistake if we see the recovery from COVID as somehow mm -hmm. separate from the SDGs. If we had made greater progress on the SDGs, we'd be in a stronger position for responding to a pandemic of this nature or any global crisis of, of, of this character. Um, and the SDGs with, you know, what they are in their, in their fundamentals, they are about, they are about making globalization and our growing economies, ones that are fairer and more sustainable for all people. That has got to be at the core of our recovery strategies from COVID. So when we look at the trillions of dollars that are going to be pumped into stimulus and recovery packages across the global economy, please God let that investment go into the kind of economies of the future that are going to make for the competition of the future, the good jobs of the future, and the fairer outcomes of the future that we need. And to me, a lot of that is embedded in what the SDGs are about and frankly, the Paris Climate Agreement as well. But clearly, there was a huge and immediate response in terms of the SDGs with countries signing up. How much do you think the, the ambitions defined by those 17 goals are actually finding expression, for example, in the kind of um, public subsidy, the Build Back Better agenda that we're seeing in a whole number of, of countries? Are we seeing the kind of energy mandates in relation to aviation or conditionality in relation to sustainability that you would want to be seeing? Or is it frankly still too early in the crisis to make that judgment? Well, I think it's it's early, but it's also late at the same time. Look, I mean, I think you've probably and those on the call probably have have seen a lot of the numbers. There is more funding going into propping up the economies of the past than investing in the economies of the future. And so that really is the choice before governments and business leaders as well in thinking about, you know, their long term balance sheets and where they see risk and reward as we as we look at the, 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 the future landscape. So that really is those are the questions and that need to be answered. I, I hope in a very, uh, a very positive way. If we make some of the wrong choices, by the way, and lock in significant investments in infrastructure that will take us farther off course when it comes to climate change, we'll be in a very, very dangerous place. Let's try and relate this fascinating conversation, if you like, to what's actually going to happen, albeit virtually, in terms of the, the 75th General Assembly meeting. Looking through the agenda, there's a focus on transforming the world through sustainable development, as we've just been discussing, the loss of global biodiversity, gender 25 years on from that remarkable conference in Beijing. What do you think is most likely to cut through the noise, all of the noise that we're witnessing globally at the moment, and make the headlines, and more importantly, make a difference at the end of this year's General Assembly? Sure, and this will be a general assembly like no other. Um, clearly, COVID will be very high uh, on the agenda, as will climate and the, the SDGs. Biodiversity will be high on the agenda. There's a major uh, session on, on biodiversity and the challenges and pressures on, on natural systems on which we all depend. There will undoubtedly also be political theater at the GA. It wouldn't be a GA without it. I think one of the challenges will be trying to differentiate the theater from, from the the real meat of the moment. 
but I'll tell you what I think the messages should be for, for this year's GA. What they should be is a clear message that no one, no country will win if we go down the path of vaccine nationalism, if we succumb to beggar thy neighbor economics, if we miss the window to arrest the climate emergency, if we lose a generation to conflict and hunger, and if we let distrust and suspicion cloud our strategic judgment, there's no winner there. Second, that the systems on which we depend for our very lives, and a lot of that is in the agenda of the next uh, the couple of weeks around the GA, food, climate, nature, are under extreme and irreversible duress unless we act differently. And third, that world leaders recognize that history will judge what they do in this moment. And they need to be brave enough to lead and prepared to commit to common endeavor in areas that will lift up all their populations, even if they fiercely compete in others. Cooperation doesn't mean you all get along all of the time. Cooperation is about structuring politics so that you, know, you can pursue your national interests in a way that doesn't unduly impoverish either your own population or others. So you know, I think a lot of that can and should start by showing greater unity of purpose around a safe and accessible and well-distributed COVID vaccine. Um, and here I just, you know, before um, continuing, I want, I want to give tremendous credit to the UK government here because, you know, you, you all have shown real leadership around a whole suite of issues, whether it was Gavi replenishment, the support that you're giving to innovations like the ACT Accelerator and the COVAX facility in response to COVID, you know, taking on the, the Conference of Parties on Climate with seriousness, you have the G7 next year. So that kind of leadership is really noticed, it's really vital, and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge it. Listen, I, I appreciate your generous words. Let's just focus on this for a second, and then we're getting some questions that I'm keen, that people are putting in the chat box that I'd be keen to run through with you. As you describe the jeopardy of an America first, a Russia first, a China first approach, the risks of vaccine nationalism, it seems overwhelmingly obvious to me that this is a moment in time that demands not just common sense, but common humanity, a sense that none of us are safe till all of us, all of us are safe. But how do we bridge the gap between that truth and the policies that we're seeing in many countries today? What's the role of the UN Secretary General? Is there a role for the Security Council that was notably silent for the early months of this pandemic crisis? Just if that's what many people believe are the correct answers for the pandemic, a strengthening of those multilateral systems, what tools do we have in the toolkit to try and make that more real in the second half of 2020 than in the first half? Well, clearly this is, you know, this is one of the deepest dividing lines of our times. And it plays out on a range of issues. It plays out domestically as well as internationally on the issues that we're, we're just talking about. Um, we have a ferocious media environment that is, uh, is, is threatening in many respects um, and clearly part of what we all need to tackle. I think leadership in from every quarter that it can be exercised and we're seeing a tremendous diversity of new leadership on both the international and the domestic stage. Some of it's coming from the business community, some of it comes from states and city leaders, some of it comes from social movements and young people and everyone with a voice needs to use it. <laughs> everyone who can speak out and in their actions and in their words be a defender of precisely what you just said, common humanity, where the state are so high. That includes the Secretary General. It includes someone going to the voting booth. It is, it, this is really a time where virtually every choice we make, especially if we have influence, but even if we don't think we do, is consequential. And so, you know, I just appeal to, to everyone on the line and just in all of our lives that we really recognize how uh, how meaningful daily choices are in standing up for humane values, in rewarding our politicians for making good choices, and strategic choices that are in the interests of all of our countries. Right, so let's move to some of the questions that have been submitted. The first question from Rafael Moreto, considering that multilateralism is actually continuing, but not via the, the usual proper to, uh, properly objected UN standards, mainly through the pandemic, um, and the responses there too. Um, let, let, he asks the following question. Bearing in mind that the multilateral crisis dates back to 2011, precisely during the onset of the war again uh, within Syria, 
and the Arab Republic. Um, how can the United Nations, via the United Nations Security Council, as well as the General Assembly, foster the multilateralism to continue despite all of the current past, present and coming challenges? How much does the failure to act in the past inhibit the capacity to move forward together in the future? That is a very big, juicy question. <laughs> Look, I think past failures, of which Syria is obviously a shameful and continuing one, um, have got to motivate us to do better in the future. So that's just a, fir a, a first point. Um, I think you, in a way you've restated the question, the question that we're trying to, we've been, we've been talking about from the beginning of this conversation. Um, there are failures as well as achievements on the multilateral front. And at the end of the day, this is about everyone who invests in the multilateral system. It's about countries and their leadership. It's about the citizens who hold their politicians to account. And it's about the kind of world we want to be in and how it is we think that our communities and our citizens will best prosper. I think they best prosper where there is a healthy terrain for cooperation. Again, that doesn't mean people cooperate about everything. There are plenty of fights to be had in the world and there are big ones on our agenda. But trying to, to compete in, a, in conditions where you don't underinvest in cooperation where you can find it and where you recognize that there are some interests and some objectives that simply can't be uh, can't be acquitted without working together in some fashion. And that's really what the system has got to be about going forward. Let's just stick with that theme of working together. This is a question from Caroline Langdon. Can someone give me a definition of multilateralism, please? Does it mean action by all countries together at the same time or not? What would be your answer to Caroline's question? I probably should have a really pithy answer to this, but look at the, <laughs> what multilateralism really means is about countries recognizing that they get more done when working in cooperation with others and by going it alone. That can be in small form or it can be in universal form. You have bodies like the United Nations, they're a universal body, but they're chock full of coalitions and caucuses and not everybody does everything in equal measure at the same time. You have other, um, other groupings, G7, G20, those are multilateral too. So is NATO. So it's really just uh, a, a logic that there is value in countries working together with common purpose when they have common interests and values uh, behind them. It's not perfect, but it's better than the alternative. Now, of course, here in the United Kingdom, we've just over recent years made the momentous decision to leave one of those multilateral institutions, the European Union. The next question comes from Mike Maiden. Does the UK becoming or being a voice separate from the European Union represent an opportunity for the UK to play a new leadership role or does it diminish the UK's voice? What would be your perspective on that question, Elizabeth? I'm tempted to turn it back to you, <laughs> but look, I think I think this is the question we're all and part of in um, what we're seeing in the um, the the global leadership that the UK is seeking to 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 play over the last year. I I suspect is related to the with, to 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 Brexit and to trying to show a different form of global leadership on the world stage. I think we can only welcome that, uh, whatever the conditions that prompted it. And, um, and that's what we need from others as well, to recognize that this is, uh, this is, this is a moment where, where leadership is needed and we'll take it from whatever quarter it comes. In the next question, we're moving from Europe to Asia. It's a question from Sam Dawes. China has engaged more over the last five years in both formal and informal multilateral institutions. What are the implications for the growing rivalry between China and the United States for the evolving nature of these institutions and China's own path? Well, and hello, Sam. It's nice to hear you on the line. Um, and you've written widely about this, so um, welcome the question. Um, look, I think it's no surprise that multilateral institutions, like any other arena of world politics, would also be a terrain of competition between 
two of the world's largest <laughs> largest powers, and uh, particularly as China is asserting itself increasingly in the world and on the world stage, this is a place where they're seeking to do it, and they are playing a much more visible and vocal role, taking more explicit positions in uh, multilateral institutions than historically they ever had done. Um, this is one of the fundamental questions we need to be be asking of ourselves and look and watching very closely and interacting with as we look at the effectiveness of these, not just the institutions, but the multilateral order that, order that underpins it. Um, I think that's one of the, uh, to my mind, um, great implications also of a comparative U.S. withdrawal from multilateral uh, institutions and mechanisms as it creates even more space. So that is, you know, this is one of the flashpoints of our times. Well, happily, but unsurprisingly, you're being paid compliments as well as asked questions. Mike Harwood says, excellent answers, Ambassador, and asks if there are any books that young people or indeed older people should be reading in order to inspire them both about the United Nations and multilateralism more generally. I'm tempted to say you should read Sam. I mean, you could read many people on the line, uh, needless to say. It's a great question, actually. I mean, I, I would, um, I want to think about it more, actually, but I, um, there are quite a number of memoirs about people who've led lives of public service in the context of the UN and international diplomacy that I think all are incredibly rewarding reads and they can be everything from you know the biographies of Sergio Vieira de Mello to um, to books about Kofi Annan to books about early mediators of peace processes I think a lot of those stories really give you a very lived sense of what it means for people to join international public service in different forms it doesn't have to be the UN it can be other other forms of international uh, public service humanitarian service um, there are some phenomenal podcasts I would recommend, <laughs> something called Awake at Night that's about UN humanitarians in the field. It's just a very mm. powerful rendering of, uh, of what that kind of life means and why people, why people do it. Christina Figueres' new podcast, I'm thoroughly and enjoying she's fabulous. it for the same reason that it, it, I would challenge anybody to listen to that and not be inspired by the kind of international public service that you describe. Um, right. Next question from Jazdev Rai. He says, isn't the problem that the United Nations has been promoting one worldview and sees multilateralism of different powers working together rather than different civilizations working together? Cultures and civilizations are seen as idiosyncrasies rather than parallel ideologies. Hence, rather than being able to help a world that is now changing, the United Nations may be a hindrance due to its own commitment to one ideology of the perfect world much like religions do. Well, well, I have to say that as a former grizzled negotiator, I would love to have seen that one world at some point, but it felt more to me over the years like a, a lot a lot of different worlds, contending views, contending cultures. I mean, every single negotiation at the United Nations is chock full of those tensions and debates about the values on which we're operating, what policy positions people should take. So I actually see a lot more heterogeneity in the context of the UN than any kind of singular, uh, singular worldview. I do think the UN system, and let's just like break it down, this started with a handful of countries, 50 in 1945, who had just emerged from the second world conflagration in a generation who decided that maybe it was a good idea to not do that again. And so they wanted to create an institution, you know, again, not romanticized, an institution based on clear national interest about how do you try to put the world in a somewhat more stable and peaceful place and try to create opportunity for greater progress? So, I, you know, I would go back to, uh, I think it's a very good idea these days to reread the UN Charter. It is a document that stands an incredible test of time. And so the only thing you can fault the UN for on these grounds, I honestly think, is, is believing in the possibility of human progress not thinking it's inevitable. The whole point of the institution is that it's not inevitable. It's that it has to be built and patiently argued and fought over. So, um, uh, you know, but I, but uh, these, are, these, are, these are deep questions. Let me ask you another question that's come in from Paddy Coulter from Article 19, which is actually not about progress, but regression in one area of, of um, human progress. He said, it's good to hear about the importance of voice and speaking out but the metrics show globally freedom of, freedom of expression is actually at its lowest point in a decade. Absolutely. 
what more can and should the United Nations be doing to counter this trend? Yeah, no, absolutely. This is one of the more worrying and frightening trends of the last period, I think, is the silencing of opposition, the threats to human rights <laughs> advocates, um, the repression of political dissent in so many quarters and in so many different ways. Uh, so you're absolutely right about the premise of the question. I think part of what we need to look to the UN system to do and UN leaders to do and people in and around the UN is to speak out about that fact, to be vocal defenders of uh, the values on which the institution was created, the values embedded in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, and also to provide practical tools and supports for people in a variety of contexts who are vulnerable to that kind of repression. That's part of what the High Commissioner for Human Rights uh, is about and the different field presences that they, they feel, but obviously this is not for the UN alone to do. This is a matter of deep strategic import in the world for countries as well as citizens. And I agree with you completely. It's a very, very disturbing um, trend. And the next question focuses on that balance between sovereignty and multilateralism. Mark Odian's question, in a country like Nigeria, where there is a lot of killing, unrest, and the government is seen as doing nothing, Going by the definition of multilateralism, how can it help to bring peace to a country and hold the, the government accountable? What's that balance between the reach of those ambitions from the United Nations and the lived reality in a country like Nigeria? Well, I think the balance comes, um, the balance is all about what's ha what happens in individual countries. I mean, the UN, this is part of um, part of the story when I mentioned needing to go back to basics about what the UN system is about and what it's for and what a multilateral system is about and what it's for. It's not for everything that matters in the world. Um, you know, a lot of things that matter in the world and matter at a very local level or a national level are for countries and their citizens and their constituencies to, to be doing in their own their own terms and their own, their own ways. Um, I do think in any number of complex um, con situations of which probably all of our countries are, are examples, um, part of what the UN does do is work with people in a country, works with local leaders, works with civil society, is in, particularly in the development side of what the UN does, um, but also in some of its peace work as well. So um, these are complex um, complex dynamics. You can't look to the UN to be solving all of them, but you can look to the UN to be a standard bearer for the values that matter. And the next question, which comes from Harab Sarjov, actually focuses on the question of failed states and the combination of development and security that you were describing. The question says, in the world, many people are living under a failed government or facing failed states. The United Nations is a club of failed states has little or no effect on the lives of those protesting today. What difference does the United Nations make for those living under a failed state? Well, I think the question, the larger question is not what difference does the United Nations make for a failed state, it's what is the international community prepared to do in conditions of extreme fragility and state failure? And I would dispute a bit the premise of the question. I don't think lots of people are living in conditions of failed states. I think there are some severe cases of state failure. There are a lot of cases of state fragility that aren't remotely approaching failure, but it's about a whole complex of challenges and pressures on those states that come from anything from the global economy to, 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 um, to conflict to climate change. So we need to look at specific conditions for what's actually at play and then figure out if the UN has a useful and meaningful practical role to be able to support some of those populations and, and governments or, or if it's for, for others. But um, I, I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the question. You mentioned climate change in your answer. Let me, we're drawing towards the end, but let me ask you a question about climate because it would be remiss of us not to focus specifically given the scale of the planetary disaster that we're confronting. Given that the Conference of the Parties, COP26, has been postponed for very understandable reasons due to the pandemic, do you feel that this has had a negative impact on the case for action on climate change? Or does the delay actually afford us a new opportunity and indeed an opportunity for governments to make their own nationally determined contributions more ambitious, potentially leading to greater collective success when the meeting takes place next November. 
Right. Well, if we were already already in a race to accelerate ambition beyond the commitments that countries already made, and virtually every country faces a dynamic between those who want to push for ambition and a temptation to fall back toward inertial dynamics that would take you further from the ambition that we need. Um, I think it's less about delay. I mean, we're already late, <laughs> but we uh, should and governments need to use every opportunity to raise ambition on the climate front. Um, I hope what governments around the world and leaders will see that this is an incredible opportunity with the amount of money being pushed into the global economy to try to recover from, from the crisis that we're in now to jumpstart the transition to a net zero economy and try to win the race for the economic future. I mean, I mentioned this earlier, we can, you know, we have an unprecedented shot right now at investing in the jobs and the infrastructure of, uh, of a climate friendly future economy. So um, I really truly hope that that's the spirit in which um, government Governments will come to the table and use the course of the next year in the lead up to the next COP to be able to come to the table with something really serious, which is not just about what they're saying to each other, but principally it's what, about what they're saying to their own, their own citizens. Well, Elizabeth, apart from live streaming this on the RUSI website and broadcasting it on YouTube and having an audience from around the world, I want you to feel completely relaxed in answering the last question because you're amongst friends. But in all seriousness, how big an inflection point do you think the coming presidential election in the United States on November the 3rd is going to be? What, as much as you're able to share with us, difference do you think a Biden or a Trump presidency would make to the operation, the capacity of the United Nations to address some of the questions we've been discussing today? Wow, I thought I'd get through this without you asking that question. <laughs> Look, um, I think... Uh, no one can overestimate how important this election is for the United States, for the health of our own democracy, for the standing of the United States in the world, and given the weight and continuing influence of the United States for the shape of world politics for some time. And it's no secret that the current administration is skeptical of international institutions and alliances and that it takes a pretty transactional approach to foreign policy. And if they stay on the same path in a second term, it would pose a grave threat to the infrastructure of cooperation that for generations has been essential to any number of achievements in the world that we've been talking about. It's been essential to American leadership and frankly, to the interests of the American people. It's also no secret that a Biden foreign policy would set a different course, but you know, either administration will also face some common challenges. They will both need to deal, I hope, in a productive way with the rise of China. They will both face a ferocious domestic agenda that needs to command their significant attention. And they will both face the continuing and sustained challenge of dealing with COVID-19 and its longer term impacts, both domestically and internationally. And what I hope either administration would also recognize is that precisely when the global and domestic agendas are as tough and as crowded as they are, your friends matter. Burden sharing helps. International institutions are important practical levers and the international system is far more effective with US leadership in it than without. Well, listen, Elizabeth, I expected you to offer an answer that revealed years of diplomatic training, but Thankfully, that combined not just grace and judgment, but actually some real insight in terms of the fact that whoever wins, whether it is Trump or Biden, there are global public goods that need to be addressed. And it is uh, a choice for those of you in the United States, but the consequences will be felt by all of us around the world for the choice that is reached, if not on the night, then at least in the weeks following November the 3rd. Let me just try and draw this um, webinar to a close. I'm conscious that we started slightly late, so I want to make sure that we finish on time. Firstly, I'll really just begin where I, uh, my remarks, where I began the seminar, which is to say thank you to you, Elizabeth, for offering us such wise counsel and interesting perspectives on what is an unusual, indeed unprecedented, virtual General Assembly on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of the General Assembly but one that I believe is urgent and timely in terms of the issues that are going to be addressed. Whether 
continued pursuit towards the sustainable development goals as we discussed, whether the urgency of meeting the climate challenge, whether the immediate crisis that are afflicting so many countries at the moment in terms of COVID or its economic consequences. It seems to me that the coming weeks are almost the definition of a teachable moment. And in that sense, I'm grateful to you for the opportunity that you've shared with us today to let us benefit from some of your insights and perspectives in terms of the future of multilateralism and the UN system more generally. Let me say thank you both to you, Elizabeth, for your time today. Thank you to all of the participants who have joined us. Apologies again for the delay in starting the webinar, but I think we've more than made up for it in terms of the quality of both the questions and the answers. And simply in concluding, announce that our next seminar, um, our next webinar for RUSI members is entitled Building Stronger Societies, Organizing Ourselves for the Next Crisis. And that will be with Craig Fugatti, the administrator of the US Federal Emergency Management Agency, and is scheduled to take place on Wednesday on the 16th of September at four o'clock UK time. There'll be more information available for people on the RUSI website. But with that, let me conclude today's webinar. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you to everybody who was able to join us. I very much look forward to participating with you again in future conversations. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. It's a pleasure to join you.